Hello. Welcome back to Archival Adventures. I hope that you are all having a wonderful day wherever you happen to be. I hope that you are managing to maintain a reasonable temperature, um, whether that be staying cool, if you're in a place that is presently very hot, like I am, or staying warm if you're in a place that's presently very cold. Um, <clears throat> let me see, I do see that there are a couple of people uh, who have been chatting away in the, um, the Rogan 27 channel. So, um, hello, Hannah, welcome back. Ah! Um, now I have to remember how to do all the Wednesday things. Yeah, there are Wednesday things, I think. And hello, Lord Portico, welcome. I did not expect to see you on Wednesday, but I am very appreciative that you are here. Um, indeed, yes, thank you both for being here. Hello, Key Squared. Um, I'm gonna try and do better about introductions on this. So, um, I believe it is, yes, Wednesday. Um, so, welcome to Archival Adventures. I am Anthony Wright de Hernandez, um, also known some places on the internet as Rogan27, and this show is a show where I share materials from Special Collections and University Archives at Virginia Tech. Um, most of the materials I have never seen before. And so you get to encounter them in real time with me and um, we get to see what there is. Uh, so this week we're doing high energy physics um, as part of our high energy physics series. This is episode six in that subseries. And we will be looking at materials about nuclear ship Savannah. And if you're not familiar with what that is, well, that's kind of what the whole point is, right? Um, <laughs> looks for the department in charge of telling me what day of the week it is. It's called a calendar. You shouldn't need an entire department. Just, just a few tens of people, right? Um, I can give you a hint, though, about nuclear ship Savannah and what we shall be looking at um, yeah this will work for a, a little hint let me um, we will be did it switch no it didn't it's been a month that is the nuclear ship Savannah. That is NS Savannah. And um, yeah, we're gonna be looking at a bunch of stuff about this ship. So it's exciting. I'm very excited. Um, quickly before we dive in and start actually like digging into the, the documents, I do uh, as always, want to just um, quickly share the Land and Labor Acknowledgement uh, for Virginia Tech. Uh, Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tudelo and Monacan people's homeland, and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that the Moral Land Grant College Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of Native nations from their lands in Western territories. We understand that honoring Native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tudelo and Monacan peoples and other Native nations, we commit to changing the tra trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing Indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. Virginia Tech acknowledges that its Blacksburg campus sits partly on land that was previously the site of the Smithfield and Solitude Plantations, owned by members of the Preston family. Between the 1770s and the 1860s, the Prestons and other local white families that owned parcels of what became Virginia Tech also owned hundreds of slaves. Er, blah. Me, me reading sentences here that I haven't read out loud in a while. <clears throat> that owned parcels of what became Virginia Tech also owned hundreds of enslaved people. Uh, we acknowledge that enslaved black people generated wealth 
that financed the predecessor institution to Virginia Tech, the Preston and Olin Institute, and they also worked on construction of its building. Not until 1953, however, was the first black student permitted to enroll. Through inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to Oprosim that I may serve. In the spirit of community diversity and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. Um, and thank you for dropping the link to that in chat for anybody who wants to poke around and maybe take a closer look at it. Um, uh, we, I do want to do a quick perusal of the finding aid just to get a little info for you about where these papers came from, who, whose they were, why we have them, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so we'll do that real quick. Oops. Almost. Too many buttons. There are too many things to press. And it's been a month since I did this. Uh, thank you for dropping the finding aid link in chat, Hannah. Uh, and I think I can make this a little bit bigger for you all. I'll just go really large. Uh, so these papers, what we're going to be looking at about nuclear ship Savannah, come from the John W. Landis papers. Um, it is one topic in the papers. We will probably revisit them in, a, in the future for uh, more of the high energy physics series, but I got really excited when I saw the, the nuclear ship Savannah stuff. So uh, John W. Landis was born in 1917. He was educated at Lafayette College, the University of Rochester, and Princeton University. Worked for the U.S. Navy Department as a consultant in guided missiles. Uh, worked for the Educational Testing Service and the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission. Uh, for many years, beginning in 1953, he was associated with the Babcock and Wilcox Company in the field of nuclear engineering. He was successively the head of customer relations, assistant manager, and manager of the Atomic Energy Division, and later general manager of their Washington, D.C. operations. Landis died in March 2013. I, I got a little tripped just because I honestly had not fully read that full thing before and did not realize he had worked for ETS, um, which if you're not familiar with them, they are the company that administers um, the SAT, or did, um, I think, if I'm remembering correctly. Now I, of course, have said that and have to double check. Uh, I mean, it's the college board, but I thought, yes, ETS. Duh. In, in uh, a previous life, I worked at um, ACT, which is also a scholastic aptitude test similar to the SAT. So seeing ETS show up in his credentials, just like, it took me a second to parse that that's what that was, because I had him in my head as just um, atomic energy. Uh, but this section here, beginning in 1953, when he was at the Atomic Energy Division of Babcock and Wilcox, is where all of the papers we're looking at today came from. Um, or, yeah, and even, sorry, going into his time in DC as manager of their DC operations. Um, because that is the period of time when Babcock and Wilcox built the nuclear engine for the NS Savannah. And there's a heck ton of material. The music is a tad loud. I will endeavor to remedy that.
let me know if, um, if the music is at a better level now. Um, so yeah, the, his papers include a bunch of stuff. The collection is not fully processed. Um, it looks to me like we had some, I don't know. When I first read this, I assumed that boxes one through 21 have been processed and everything else remains unprocessed. I'm uncertain. Non-inclusive box level inventory was created after the materials were donated and the inventory was updated several times. Ah, okay, so it, it, the collection has not been processed. Um, there is just a sort of inventory of, hey, there's stuff in here about such and such topic, but nobody's actually gone through and really looked through these boxes to, um, to like fully process them and do like full uh, description the way that we would prefer to do. Um, <clears throat> so, when I say we'll be looking at things for the first time and we may discover things, that's because we may discover things that um, aren't mentioned in the finding aid because uh, nobody has actually gone to fully describe this collection yet. Um, so, how about we actually dive in and start looking at things and see what's going on. Um, hopefully I have everything set up and it works right. So we got, okay, document focus. You should have a few, nope. There, you should have a view of that, which is the table in front of me. Um, so as always, uh, the finding aid is available for you to look at. If you see something listed in there that you'd like me to share on stream, do let me know. Um, if it's not something about the nuclear ship Savannah, I don't have it in the room, and I will make a note of it to share on a future stream. Um, but if it's something specifically that mentions Nuclear Ship Savannah, that I can do. Uh, and so let me know if you see something listed and you're like, ooh, ooh, I'm really curious about that. Um, but I thought, I thought a good place to start would be a little information about the program that led to the creation of the nuclear ship Savannah? Possibly. Either that or the story of the Savannah, which, hmm, yeah, maybe that. <laughs> I have done uh, a cursory walkthrough to identify some highlights but I haven't really looked at them. So, beyond noting that, hey, this looked like it might be interesting, I, I haven't really gone beyond that. I think, I think it's this. I don't have nice little folders to keep everything organized today because, like I said, it has not been organized. All right. Incidentally, if anybody is in chat who happens to know, I know, but I want to see if you know. Does anybody in chat know what, why this ship has the designation NS before its name? It's 
not the USS, it's not um, the HMS, it is MS. Uh, so this page here comes right before a document titled The Story of the Savannah, and I marked it because I guess I thought that this was also kind of interesting. Note to editor. To facilitate servicing of requests for pics covering various aspects of construction, sea trials, etc., of the NS Savannah, world's first atom-powered merchant ship, we have prepared this catalog of representative shots now available. Please order on the enclosed return mail card. You will be serviced promptly with 8x10 captioned glossies. A background story on the vessel is also available, and a request box is provided for it on the card. Thank you for your interest. J.O. Trudeau, Manager, Public Relations Services, The Babcock and Wilcox Company. Indeed, actually, Hannah, you are correct. NS just stands for nuclear ship. SS is steamship. The, so they need, yes, key squared. Um, but the difference, the reason it's not USS or HMS, so USS is United States ship. Uh, HMS is his majesty's ship currently. Um, not long ago, it was her majesty's ship. Uh, referencing the sovereign of the United Kingdom. Um, so SS and NS are used to designate ships that are not governmental. So in this case, the Savannah is a merchant ship, um, which is just a term that means it, it carried either cargo or people. So it's a civilian ship, which is why it has an NS, or uh, rather than like USS. Um, so this is like a preview sheet of photographs that people could order for use in like a magazine or something uh, based on the tag that's attached to it. I have a couple of the photos and I have the story that was mentioned. Um, I also have a full press kit, which when I saw that there was a full press kit for this collection, I was like, what the heck? That's amazing. And so I got, I may have gotten slightly excited. Just, just a titch. Um, all right, I got some glossies here, so I'm going to put a glove on. And then we'll, we'll get this story, because the story is going to give us, like, history about the ship, which I thought would be a nice place to start, and I just, I couldn't... When I opened it up, I was like, wait, how did I not know that we had this much stuff on a subject that is, like, this neat? And the answer is, I hadn't really looked. I wasn't out looking for it, and uh, it was off in storage somewhere, so I had never had reason to encounter it. Not like it was hiding. I looked at the, fi I ran across the finding aid, and it was like, oh. Ooh, that's kind of neat. Let's look at that. So, um, <clears throat> here we have a, ooh, I will read you the caption, which is attached, but it, it's like down here as a, an extra page. So I'll read that to you while you get to look at the picture. That sounds fun. <laughs> I don't know if fun is the right word, but it sounds like the way to move, to move forward. <clears throat> for immediate release. Cutaway drawing of the NS Savannah's pressurized water nuclear reactor and associated system components. Water of highest purity, eight million pounds of it. 
moves through the system hourly. It enters at 1,700 pounds per square inch pressure, is heated to 520 degrees Fahrenheit before leaving through upper nozzles. Even at 520 degrees Fahrenheit, water will not boil in primary system because it is kept under pressure. In heat exchanger, water gives up heat to secondary system water, turning it to steam, which drives ship's turbines. System is housed in containment vessel 35 feet in diameter and over 50 feet long, covered with half foot thick layers of lead and polyethylene. Nuclear power plant was designed, developed, and built by the Babcock and Wilcox Company, other principal suppliers to the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission and the Maritime Administration for the Ennis Savannah Project are New York Shipbuilding Corporation Shipbuilder and States Marine Lines General Operating Agent. For further info, contact Public Relations Services Babcock and Wilcox. I'm not going to read the address because the company still exists. Um, <laughs> And so this is an illustration of the actual like nuclear engine assembly that was in this 1959 test bed vessel uh, that was a proof of concept ship for the first civilian nuclear ship in the world. Which, like, we have, you don't know, we have so much stuff, so much from the people that made the engine, that made the nuclear reactor for the first civilian nuclear ship in the world. I just, like, wow. To me, that's freaking exciting. <laughs> um... <clears throat> For immediate release, N.S. Savannah, Pioneer Atom-Powered Merchant Ship, picks up speed on the at- Wow. I tried to do the voice, and I didn't take a moment before I started. I just went into it, and it made it so I couldn't read. <clears throat> N.S. Savannah, pioneer atom-powered merchant ship, picks up speed on the Atlantic off the Virginia coast during recent full-power tests of her reactor and propulsion machinery. Literally a floating laboratory vessel is designed to provide knowledge leading to peaceful maritime use of the atom the world over. It's a... It was designed as a floating laboratory to figure out civilian uses for atomic power. Like, it's super cool. This is unique in 1959 because it is not a military vessel and it doesn't have masts or giant smokestacks. It doesn't look like the Titanic because it doesn't have giant smokestacks. It's not a sail ship. There was no other vessel like it at the time. It was the first to, to not have smokestacks. or masts. Like today, that's not surprising. But it was, it was new, it was nifty, it was neat, it was, okay. I might be a little excited. <clears throat> How about this one? For immediate release, one of 32 fuel elements which make up the core of the NS Savannah's reactor is shown being slipped from protective plastic envelope 
into orifice of special reactor vessel loading head. Complete core was assembled in a little more than 30 hours. Each element contains 164 fuel rods loaded with pellets of uranium oxide enriched in uranium-235 to 4.2% and 4.6%. Total uranium fuel in core is 8,060 kilograms. It's very weird <laughs> just seeing a ship without all the bits sticking up. I know! I have more photos in the press kit, but those were the ones that were attached uh, or were co-located, let's say, because they weren't attached, but co-located with um, this document, the story of the Savannah, <clears throat> which I'm going to try and I think zoom in a little bit, and I need to be a little gentle because I don't think, yeah, I do not have my micro spatula with me, no. <laughs> so I don't actually have a decent tool, ooh, I might actually, give me one second. Possibility. I don't think I have it, but let me check. Nope. Sadly, I do not have the micro spatula with me. Uh, it is down at my desk in my office. So I don't have a, a good tool for removing the staple, so I just need to be gentle and try not to like damage the page. Uh, but let's see what they have to say here. This is uh, from the United States Atomic Energy Commission. Um, it doesn't have a date on it, but it's going to be 1959-ish for sure. It just doesn't, it's undated, but it's certainly, after 59, I would say, let's see, 140. Yeah. So sometime in 59, just based on the introduction here, plus 59 is when the Savannah launched. <clears throat> but uh, <clears throat> the story of the Savannah. More than 140 years ago on May 22nd, 1819, a 320-ton ship started an epoch-making voyage from Savannah, Georgia to Liverpool, England. She was the SS Savannah, the first vessel to use steam on a transatlantic crossing. The 29-day, 11-hour voyage was successful even though the little craft could carry only enough coal and wood to permit about 89 hours of actual steam propulsion. As the Savannah ushered in the steam age in ocean travel, it is fitting that another Savannah should usher in the atomic age of merchant shipping. This is the 22,000 ton nuclear ship, Savannah, the world's first nuclear powered cargo passenger ship. The new Savannah is another first, as important as was its namesake, the tiny vessel which opened the era of steam navigation almost a century and a half ago. 
construction of the NS Savannah was undertaken in accordance with the policy of the President and the Congress to foster and develop the American merchant fleet. Uh, yes, there are photos on the, the uh, Wikipedia site. There is also, th there are a couple of different sites. It's, it's now a museum ship. Um, and so there's a society that's concerned with trying to maintain it and make sure that people know about it. Um, it's owned by um, whichever part, whichever government, governmental agency oversees the um, military museum ships because of the, uh, uh, because of the nuclear engine, that's the, the group that um, actually owns it, and I can't recall their name at the moment, but I'll have it in a second. Um, So there's the NS Savannah Association, which is um, just a group of people that like it and want to make sure that it um, that people know about it. Um, oh yeah, it's um, it is the Maritime Administration, which is a department of the U.S. Department of Transportation that owns Nuclear Ship Savannah, and it is a museum ship that I believe is docked in Baltimore, Maryland. <clears throat> right. the, the vessel is intended to demonstrate to the world, one, the intent of the United States to employ the power of the atom for peaceful, productive purposes, and two, the feasibility of using nuclear energy to power merchant ships. It is not expected that the Savannah, as the first ship of its kind, will be economic, since costs of such a prototype are necessarily high. It is expected, however, that the Savannah will pioneer the way to construction of other nuclear merchant vessels, which eventually will prove to be economically competitive with those powered by conventional means. The development of the Savannah has been the joint responsibility of the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission and of the Maritime Administration of the U.S. Department of Commerce. Design and construction of the ship was carried out under the direction of a joint group comprised of personnel from both the Maritime Administration and the Atomic Energy Commission. The vessel was designed by George G. Sharp Incorporated of New York and was built by the New York Shipbuilding Corporation of Camden, New Jersey. The Babcock and Wilcox Company of New York designed and built the Savannah's 69 thermal megawatt pressure, pressurized water reactor. <clears throat> States Marine Lines of New York was chosen to operate the Savannah as general agent for the Maritime Administration. States Marine has supplied the ship's crew, including deck officers and highly trained reactor engineers. Uh, so the document here, I will read some more of it because it's, it's, it'll give some good info, but it's not really anything to look at, so I'm going to throw a picture back up. Um, like it's, it's just literally just printed, just, just like a computer printout sort of type document. It's not... I guess it must be typed or, or photocopied, maybe? I'm not sure, um, given the date of when it was made. But it's not like a, an interesting handwritten document, or it's, it's less visually interesting than looking at the ship itself. <laughs> so let me zoom in a little, maybe? Nope, that's out. Get a nice, nice view of. Oh, that's a little too close. Of the Savannah. <clears throat> Significant dates. 
Building of a nuclear-powered merchant vessel was first proposed by former President Dwight D. Eisenhower in a speech in New York on April 25, 1955. Construction was authorized by Congress on July 20, 1956. The contract with Babcock and Wilcox, Co Wilcox Company for development and fabrication of the nuclear propulsion system was awarded in April 1957. The contract for construction of the Savannah was signed with the New York Shipbuilding Corporation in December 1957, and the keel for the ship was laid by Riss Mrs. Richard Nixon on National Maritime Day, May 22, 1958. And the vessel was launched on July 21, 1959 with Mrs. Dwight D. Eisenhower as sponsor. Okay, they had first names, historical document. Construction of the Savannah was essentially completed in the spring of 1961. Um, so it launched July 21st, 1959, but construction wasn't really complete until 1961. Um, <clears throat> and incidentally, yes, indeed, I do know that uh, Mrs. Nixon had a name and Mrs. Eisenhower had a name I'm not sure I've ever heard either of their first names. So I need to look them up because I get that it was very much socially social convention at the time to um, call wives Mrs. and then their husband's name, but they also had names of their own, and sometimes there is no documentation of a wife other than the husband's name, which for these, I, I know that's not the case. Um, Pat. Mrs. Nixon's first name is Pat. Or was, I'm not, I didn't click into the full article on her. Um, and Mrs. Eisenhower's name uh, Mamie, of course. Yeah, I, I did know Mamie Eisenhower. I just had forgotten it. I did not know Pat Nixon. Um, anywho, the document just used Mrs. in front of their husband's names. Um, after public hearings on the safety of the ship's nuclear system in March and April 1961, and following extensive tests of the reactor and the propulsion plant, the Savannah's reactor was loaded with uranium oxide fuel on November 27 and 28, 1961. Criticality, or a sustained nuclear chain reaction, occurred December 21st, 1961, and was followed by zero and low power tests of the reactor at the New York Shipbuilding Corporation yard at Camden, up to a level of 10% of the reactor's design power. The ship was then moved under auxiliary power from temporary boilers to Yorktown, Virginia, for full power reactor operation and for her initial sea trials. Since the Savannah is a prototype ship, many special features, such as provision for extensive remote operation of components and the possibility of rapid maneuvering rates have been incorporated into the vessel's construction and equipment for evaluation in future ship design. Components and even entire plant systems will be changed when it is indicated that significant technical advancements can be made by doing so. To sum up, the Savannah has five important missions. One, to demonstrate to the world the employment of nuclear power as an instrument of peace for the benefit of mankind. Two, to bring the power of the atom into the marketplaces of the world in peaceful trade and commerce. Three, to demonstrate that nuclear-powered merchant ships are dependable and safe. I don't know, do we still have nuclear-powered merchant ships? 
I, I kind of feel like we must, and I would think it, I would be surprised if we didn't, but I don't actually know. To stimulate early, four, to stimulate early solutions to such problems as international liability and indemnification, and to achieve acceptance for nuclear ships in world ports. Five, to give the Atomic Energy Commission and the Maritime Administration the opportunity for assessing the contributions of atomic power to the progress of the American Merchant Marine. How the atom drives a ship. Not a lot. So probably not still making them. What is the most common form of propulsion for civilian ships today. Is it, is it diesel? I'm curious. I, I'm not familiar. Is it steam power, like diesel, diesel engine steam power? Or is it, I don't know. If, if anybody wants to poke around and look, you can. Otherwise, I may do some poking in a minute just to see diesel-driven steam turbines. See, I feel like they would have incorporated like the um, adaptations of a steam-based engine, because they took steamships and then they made this nuclear ship that was still steam-powered, essentially, because the nuclear engine worked by heating up water to generate steam. Um, so I would assume that if that modern ships are using basically the same thing, but without the nuclear reactor. So some other form of internal combustion engine, but still just running steam turbines. That's my assumption, but I honestly hadn't thought of it. I hadn't thought about it at all. <clears throat> How the atom drives a ship. That title, immediately made me think that I needed some sort of like cartoon illustration. Um, like uh, if you've ever seen the movie Jurassic Park, um, there's the little animated like DNA cartoon thing at the beginning, uh, giving the exposition about like how they cloned dinosaurs. This whole how the atom drives a ship title um, made me immediately think that we needed a, like a little cartoon like that. Uh, <clears throat> we'll see what the content says and whether it would seem appropriate, but that's where my brain went. <clears throat> the reactor of a nuclear powered vessel performs the same function as does the oil burning equ equipment in a conventionally powered vessel. This function is to produce heat, which with which to generate the steam needed to turn the ship's turbines and propeller shaft. A reactor is simply an atomic furnace. Heat is produced in this furnace by continued chain reaction, splitting or fissioning of the atoms of the nuclear fuel. In the type of reactor installed in the savanna, water is circulated under pressure through the heart or core of the nuclear reactor, sorry, through the heart or core of the reactor as the fissioning process takes place. The water removes the intense heat created in the reactor core by splitting of the fuel atoms and transfers this heat to a secondary system of piping located in a device called a heat exchanger. Ooh, we're getting some actual like engineering description. <clears throat> and I could also, I just realized, like, it's lovely. I'm, I'm glad that I shared a close-up of the photo, but I could also throw the words up on screen next to the photo if I can just get control of the camera. Please. It timed out my control. It is a pretty ship. 
It is. It is quite nice looking, actually. Yeah. Um, okay, let's see. I can I can zoom out and try and get photo next to words. Best of both worlds. Why didn't I think of that before? I don't know that I'll read this entire document, but so far I haven't run it I haven't run out of interesting things. <clears throat> Water in this secondary system is changed to steam for propulsion of the vessel. The nuclear fuel in the Savannah's reactor comprises approximately 17,000 pounds of enriched uranium oxide. A single core of the fuel is expected to supply enough energy to operate the ship for three and a half years without replacement. Approximately 90,000 tons of fuel oil would be needed to produce an equivalent amount of energy in a conventionally powered vessel. There are a number of reasons why nuclear-powered merchant ships are expected to have distinct advantages over conventionally driven craft. Two significant reasons may be summarized briefly as follows. On long voyages, nuclear ships will be able to carry larger cargoes because their reactors will require less space than conventional oil-burning equipment and fuel tanks. Nuclear ships will be able to operate on longer runs at higher sustained speeds than conventional ships. The Savannah is a single propeller ship with an overall length of 595 feet 6 inches. She has a molded beam of 78 feet and her design draft is 29 feet 6 inches when fully loaded. Her normal cruising speed is 20 knots. Developed with an output of 20 of 20,000 shaft horsepower from her nuclear reactor. She is a vessel of, a, of advanced design with a raked stem and a modified cruiser stern. The ship will carry 60 passengers, a crew of about 110, and about 10,000 tons of dry cargo. Savannah has six full decks. The Savannah is fitted with six complete decks. Ten main transverse watertight bulkheads divide the ship into 11 thwart ship compartments. I have not seen this term before, but I parse that sentence to mean the bulkheads divide the ship into just 11 compartments that run from port to starboard. So you would, if you were counting compartments, it would be 11 of them from the bow to the stern. So thwart ship, I think, means running from port to starboard or from side to side rather than front to back. Um, I'm not certain, but that's my guess based on my understanding of the words there. <clears throat> Navigating bridge deck. This. The uppermost deck serves a dual purpose. I wish I had a picture of the bridge deck. Do I have blueprints? I might. Let's see, fabrication of heat exchanger, installation of containment vessel, atom furnace, lead shielding, down the ways. Fuel element, atomic classroom, reactor testing. Hmm. Not there. Possibly in the press kit. Let me pull out the press kit and see. Because this reads like it is meant to have a photograph accompany it but it's not one of the three that we already looked at. Oh, just for your benefit. Actual press kit. It's in this vinyl uh, pouch. Press day, July 19, 1959. NS Savannah, first atom-powered merchant ship. Launching July 21, 1959. And so inside here, uh, 
is stuff. We, we will look at more of this in a second. I just want to see if there's a sort of like a layout of the ship. Because it's referencing the bridge deck. Um, I feel like I saw one, but honestly, it wasn't something I marked specifically. Ooh, technical press information. I would hope that there'd be something in there, right? Oh. Maybe, maybe not. It's got more photographs, but Aha! Aha! Um, I did find what I was looking for. And indeed, I have found what I'm looking for. Um, power room. Oh, wow, that's the engine picture. We'll look at that in a minute. Top view of reactor. <laughs> this, this is such a cool collection. Um, come on. I have a top down. The ship. Inboard profile and general arrangement of sea deck and below. Let's see. How about, let's start with a B deck and above. Which is what's being described. So, we are currently talking about the navigating bridge deck. How about I zoom in on that part of the drawing? Because, all right, so we've got the top of house here. We didn't really talk about that in, in, in the description. That's like on top of everything. Navigating bridge deck. I know, it's like, it's like br blueprintiness which is excitement. <clears throat> this, the uppermost deck, serves a dual purpose. The forward end is given over to the pilot house. The pilot house. Um, with the radio room on the starboard side and the chart room on the port side. Outboard of the gyro, and radar uh, outboard of the gyro and radar equipment room. Ah, got it. I should have finished that sentence without taking a pause to look, because then it would have parsed better. But uh, the balance of the navigating bridge deck includes living quarters for three radio operators and two cadets as well as space for the fan rooms, a battery room, and the emergency generator room. Interesting. I guess I never even imagined that people would actually live on the bridge deck. Huh. The pilot house is completely outfitted with the latest navigation and communication equipment. Dominating the area is the wheelhouse control console housing all conventional wheelhouse instrumentation. The magnetic compass is of the reflecting type, the first to be manufactured in this country. On either side of the steering stand are the latest type of navigational radars, the first to use true motion presentation of data. Another important unit in the wheelhouse is the control console for the anti-roll stabilizers which are located on the port and starboard side sides amidships. The stabilizer fins are operated hydraulically by a gyro system capable of sensing sea conditions and providing the countermeasure for reduction of the roll. Each fin has a lift of approximately 70 tons 
at 20 knots. Meteorological instruments for recording seawater temperature, atmospheric pressure, wind direction and velocity, humidity and air temperature are incorporated into the vessel, making her a veritable floating weather station. A special radio facsimile receiver is designed to receive worldwide weather map transmissions at sea from weather transmission stations throughout the world. Hi, Public Glam. Oh, that's right. The emergency generator is right there on the bridge. I was literally just yesterday reading a mystery novel where a plot point involved the problems of the malfunctioning emergency generator, which was in the same room as the malfunctioning main engine. Yes, it does seem like locating the emergency generator somewhere other than the main generator makes more sense. And having it near the people that make the decisions about what to do if you lose power also seems like it makes sense. Oh, I can stretch, too, and actually fix my posture. But thank you, Lord Portico, for the, the self-care redeem. Because... Good idea. Also, it... It has been an hour. <clears throat> okay. Let's look at the boat deck, which is the actual name of a deck on a ship. The boat deck. Oh, look at that. We've got So I think, so I'm looking right now at the, the, I haven't read, it might tell me, but <clears throat> I'm going to speculate for a second. We have the captain's day room and captain's SR. I'm assuming SR is sleep room. Why it would be night and sleep rather than night, or why it would be day and sleep rather than day and night, I'm not certain, but um, <clears throat> and it looks like they've got, all right, I don't know where the head is, T slash S implies tub slash shower, so where's the head, with, oh, no, toilet slash shower, I bet that's what T stands for, not tub which makes more sense. I was like, why would they have a tub? But um, the person who gets equal space as the captain is the chief engineer. I don't see, okay. Huh, okay, so I'm looking at rankings. Because I'm finding this really interesting. Stateroom. Probably stateroom. The boat deck. Obviously, that is where the lifeboats are not. Um, I mean, they've got the embarkation gates. I could read the description. I'm just having fun speculating by looking at the diagram. Um, I don't have a pointy stick. I forgot I needed one. It's been a month. I forgot I wanted a, a, a pointy thing. Um, it's fine. I have, a, I have a pen that I can keep capped and point with the back end of. Um, <laughs> so we've got captain's day room, captain's state room. And next to that, the chief mate, the chief mate's office and the chief mate's stateroom, which chief mate appears to be the rank 
that for a person like me who grew up with Star Trek uh, would be equivalent to First Officer. Um, next in rank order, it and actually it looks to me like the chief engineer is probably higher ranking than the chief mate because the chief engineer has equivalent size quarters to the captain. So it looks to me like probably like the the hierarchy of the people on the ship would be captain, chief engineer, uh, chief mate, first assistant engineer, and then second mate, second assistant engineer, and then third mate. And then you've got things like junior engineer, and third assistant engineer down toward the, toward the back. There's an officer's lounge, um, which I think would probably be as close as you get to like Star Trek The Next Generation's 10 forward. All of this is speculation. Let's see what the description here says. It's very short, which is why I wanted to read the diagram, because I don't think it's going to tell us anything of what I was just... But, um, <clears throat> boat deck. This, the next uppermost deck, is devoted entirely to officers' accommodations, a spacious officers' lounge located in the aft after end affords observation on either side of the ship, as well as aft overlooking the passenger recreation area. Actually, I, based on that description, I'm thinking maybe officer's lounge would be more equivalent to the meeting room that they go to on on this on Next Generation when they have the like officers meeting. It's fun to speculate that this is a proto Starfleet ship. I know, because because I like Star Trek and I like and we do so much like with space travel, but this is like innovation in like it's the history of ocean travel, which is relevant to air travel and space travel, um, and also is just really cool in itself. Uh, next, we have the Promenade deck, uh, which is not, sadly, um, going to be like the Promenade on Deep Space Nine, where there are a bunch of shops. Unfortunately. There will be no uh, Promenade Merchants Association here. The Promenade deck. Passenger accommodation. Actually, wait. Passenger accommodation. So maybe it is. It will be the shops. Huzzah! It is. There will be a Promenade Merchants Association. I want Odo to come yell at people for causing problems on the promenade deck. Because promenade deck is passenger accommodations. I forgot it was a passenger ship. <clears throat> this deck is devoted exclusively to public rooms and spaces. A walk around the full width of the deck features a series of high windows, uh, permitting an unobstructed yet sheltered forward view of the sea. Um, so the walk around. I believe is just, just this. It's got high windows. It looks like there's two seating areas, but otherwise it's just for people to be able to like take a walk and look at the sea. Um, just behind the promenade deck walk around is the main lounge which uh, you'll see located here, the main lounge. The main, uh, blah, blah, is the main lounge, which can be closed off from the adjacent writing room. Writing room? Writing room and library. Sure.
from the adjacent writing room, library, and card room by folding screens. Card room? The card room is, so the writing room and library is here and the card room is there. Huh. I didn't know that, is it, is it normal to have a room designated for writing on a ship? Was that like a thing? Um, a novelty shop is also located on this deck. Where's the novelty shop? I see bars. Novelty shop. Oh, we've got a powder room. And next to that is a novelty shop. Interestingly, uh, we have the powder room and then we have the men's restroom. And there's a bar. Uh, I'm gonna name it Quarks. I've certainly heard of that before, a place with clear tables, good light, and a stock of writing supplies. Interesting. It, I, it had, as a concept I had never even considered. From the days when letter writing was a more prominent art, so ships had to be equipped for it on long voyages. That, uh, it makes sense, it's just not anything that ever occurred to me. Um, let's see. The main lounge is equipped with projection machinery for motion pictures, as well as for closed circuit television viewing of the reactor space. Ah, that makes total sense. Because this ship carrying passengers is not just a cruise ship. It is, it is not just a ship where people are going to, like, be on an ocean voyage to get where they're going. The ship itself is a destination because it's the first one with a nuclear reactor. So having it set up so that they can display closed circuit television of the reactor makes perfect sense. Because people are going to want to see it, even if it's kind of boring to look at. That's not going to do much, but um, I guess it's been replaced by recharging stations for your smartphone. Probably, yes. Um, the after end of the promenade deck structure includes the veranda and cocktail bar, which, through sliding glass doors, opens onto a swimming pool, swimming pool and an open deck area for the recreational use of passengers. Yeah, that's kind of like... Makes sense, fits what's it, what I would expect of a cruise ship. Not that I've ever been on one, but not, I don't know that I would want to either, but um, next we have a deck. Within the hull structure, a deck level is assigned to the main lobby. Main lobby. Um, passenger staterooms and accommodations for the purser, steward, doctor, and nurse. Sick bay! Where's sick bay? Oh, wait. It's quarters for the doctor and nurse. I would assume that sick bay is going to be nearby. Sorry, I didn't actually mean to zoom out. Um, 
cool thing. I see. I see assistant purser. I see nurse. Fan room. Barber and beauty shop. Uh, spare cabin. Lab. Doctor's stateroom, I think, is right here. And the chief purser is over here. Chief steward. But this is the doctor's stateroom. Where is the doctor's office? Does anybody see it? I don't see it. Dispensary. No. Doctor's office. Ha ha. Over here. There's the doctor's office, uh, which, and there's a men's ward and a women's ward and a crew ward and an isolation ward. And it's dispensary and a lab. And that's all right next to reactor space. Uh, <laughs> which, yay. Um, anyway, uh, let's see. The ship's hospital and dispensary are also located on this level, as is the health physics laboratory. Ah, uh, that's what the lab is, Health Physics Laboratory. <clears throat> 30 staterooms, each with private bath, accommodate one, two, or three passengers each. Some adjoining rooms open up to form suites. And then you have B deck. Apparently, I'm just gonna spend much time on this, but I think this is cool. But if you're all bored with this and want me to move on to something else, do tell. But I think it's neat. Uh, B deck. The dining room on B deck will seat approximately 75 people. So the dining room is here. Interesting. Uh, these four rooms here, government personnel or trainees. Um, a huge parabolic sculpted mural provides a dramatic background at the aft end of the room for the captain's table. Opposite, at the entrance foyer, a small golden model of the original Savannah is suspended in a glass panel. Don't break the little ships. Health physics equals checking for radiation exposure lab. Yeah, that was that was my assumption. Um, and it looks like there's a, there's a bunch of cargo spaces on B deck here. Um, you've got rooms for the deck department, uh, rooms for stewards, rooms for the engine department, officers' mess, uh, crew lounge. The engine crew has their own mess. The deck crew has their own mess. The stewards have their own mess. Each department has their own, the stewards get their own lounge. Interesting. I, just from reading this, I can see um, sort of the office politics of the, the ship crew. The officers have a mess. The engine crew and deck crew and stewards have their own messes. The crew have a lounge, but the stewards have their own lounge. And the officers have their own lounge. Let's 
see, we've got C deck. Um, Ah, yes, good. I was looking for the label and I couldn't find it. Uh, C deck. A viewing gallery on C deck. Can I locate the viewing gallery? Main laundry. Baggage butcher shop. Butcher shop. More stewards' quarters. Bonus, a bosun stores all the way forward. Uh, general cargo, general cargo, general cargo. Main laundry, passenger baggage, butcher shop. Clean linen room, soiled linen room. I don't see viewing gallery. There's a carpenter shop and the electric electronic shop. Huh. It says there's a viewing gallery. I'm just not seeing it labeled. Anyway, a viewing gallery on C deck allows visitors to observe the engine room from three sides and to look through a large uh, through the large windows separating the main engine and reactor control room. Ah, okay. So then I would assume the viewing gallery is is somewhere around here. I still don't see it like labeled specifically, but that seems because if you're able to look into the engine room from three sides, yeah. Um, the interior design and appointments of the Savannah reflect the finest products of modern American materials, craftsmanship, and technology. Bulkheads, or in less nautical language, the interior walls of the vessel are surfaced with a variety of maintenance-free materials. Furniture, incombustible beyond the requirements of the U.S. Coast Guard, features steel Al aluminum and plastics construction. Carpets, draperies, and upholstery use a maximum of man-made fibers. All public spaces, living accommodations, medical areas, passages, offices, and shops aboard the Savannah are air-conditioned. That's better than I can say about the, the spaces that I occupy on land. Uh, the vessel is equipped with five elevators. One passenger elevator, which operates between the boat deck and sea deck, two cargo elevators, and two stores elevators. Interestingly, the description says nothing about D-Deck. Uh, D-Deck appears to basically just be cargo and engine machinery, but also includes meat and poultry, fish, sugar and flour, uh, frozen foods, special storeroom number two, special storeroom number three, special storeroom number one. I can't. The, the letters are too small. I can't see what that says. I can zoom in a little bit, but I might need... Cheese! There's a whole room called cheese. Right next to the reactor. I'm sure it's fine. It just seems like, yeah, we're storing all this food right next to the reactor. That seems intelligent. But if there was a leak, it wouldn't matter because the whole ship would be contaminated. Um, keep trying to point at the screen, but somehow mysteriously I can't see you. Yeah. 
thank you for, for trying to assist. Um, there is a, uh, the inboard profile, so side view of the ship, where you can see, um, oh, also, this is the, so it's divided into 11 sections. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and 11. Uh, that can be closed off from one another to avoid, like, they can abandon a section, let it fill up with water, and the ship should still float. It is the theory that was behind how the um, bulkheads were built on the Titanic. Sadly, they didn't have the bulkheads ascend all the way through the ship on the Titanic because they wanted to have luxurious uh, l like luxurious open spaces for the rich people. So they stopped the bulkheads below those spaces so as not to divide them up, uh, which meant the bulkheads didn't go, uh, didn't go high enough to prevent the water from just filling the whole ship. Um, I think if the reactor starts leaking, the state of the wine and cheese would be the least of our problems. Yeah. Um, so, it, it going with a side view, we've got top of house, and then we've got the bridge deck. And... Uh, the boat deck and then the promenade deck is here and you can see the main lounge and the veranda um, and then below that you get uh, a deck a deck is still above above decks like, the promenade deck is like you came in on ground level and went up a floor. A deck is like ground level of, of the ship. It's not the water line. It's just like the, if you're on A deck, parts of it, you don't have a roof over your head. Um, and that's where the main lobby and the hospital and things like that are. And then if you go down a level, so as though you had gone underground by a level, uh, you get to B deck, which is where the dining room and the main galley and things like that are located. Uh, and then C deck, which appears to have like general cargo. D and, and E. Well, D, yeah. There isn't really an E. D is a taller deck and includes Shaft Alley. Shaft Alley is where like the, the equipment for running the ship's propeller um, is. So you've got Shaft Alley here. If, if you've ever seen the movie, um, the tower, uh, but not, the Poseidon Adventure, like, the original Poseidon Adventure. I don't know the new one very well, the remake. But if you've ever seen this Poseidon Adventure, <laughs> then um, you've seen Shaft Alley upside down. Um, interestingly, I like this side view because it shows the reactor space and that the reactor, that like the reactor area actually goes from the keel of the ship all the way up through a deck. That's how big the reactor is. It takes an entire, uh, an entire segment, one of an entirety, the entirety of one of the eleven segments, and goes from the keel of the ship all the way to the top. This is big.
I haven't seen this. I like I knew it existed, but I hadn't like looked at it in detail. And I, this is just really fascinating. That one says tank top as the label. I think it's I think this is an internal view from the bottom looking upward. Yeah. Instead of like a top down, this is a bottom up view of the ship as as the last thing. Cool. Uh, I'm gonna pull the photo back out so that we can <clears throat> let's see. How am I on time? We're, we're definitely uh, <laughs> let's see. The Savannah has Four aluminum lifeboats. Four lifeboats for 100 and, what, 210 people, I think, was the total. It is a very pretty ship, yes. It is quite gorgeous. Um, Savannah has four aluminum lifeboats hung from steel gravity deck davits. One has a hand-operated propeller, another is motor-propelled, and two are oar-propelled. The boats have a capacity of 190 persons. Ah, so yeah, more than enough capacity for the passengers and crew um, that would be on board, unless they were filling cargo spaces with people, which definitely was not the design. Ooh! <clears throat> Welcome in, uh, welcome in, uh, Whimsies, everybody from 16-Bit Eric's stream. Hi, hi, Eric. Um, hopefully Crusader Kings, uh, went well for you. Um, welcome to Archival Adventures. Uh, if you're new here, I am Anthony Wright Day Hernandez, otherwise known on the internet as Rogan27, and, um, you have joined my, um, my Wednesday show where I share materials from the Archives and Special Collections at uh, Virginia Tech University. Um, this week is episode or is part six of our high energy physics series, and I am looking at uh, materials from the Landis papers. Um, my brain stopped for a second. I'm looking at materials from the Landis papers about nuclear ship Savannah, uh, which was the very first civilian nuclear powered ship. So um, we have a lot of material and I've literally spent almost two hours on like two things because they're really cool and, and amazing and interesting. Um, but welcome in, it's great to have you joining us. Um, if anybody wants to, um, there are also people viewing over on um, the twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios channel, um, which is short for Virginia Tech University Libraries Studios. Um, and uh, hi, Rank. Uh, it's good to, good to see you over there. Um, but yeah, welcome, everybody. I've got a chat full of gaming nerds. You love maps. Yes. And and ships, and we, we were literally looking at maps of the decks of this ship a, a few moments ago. So that'll that's it'll be in the VOD for sure. Um, let's see. Uh, the ship is equipped with two 12,000 pound Danforth cast steel bow anchors and one 12,000 pound Danforth cast steel spare bow anchor. Each bow anchor is furnished with 165 fathoms of 2.5 inch cast steel stud link chain. The steering gear is a four cylinder electro hydraulic ram type driving the crosshead through a Rapson slide. Two independent power plants are capable of handling the rudder with a maximum torque requirement of about 7 million inch pounds. The rudder is a balanced streamlined spade type capable of turning 38 degrees port and starboard. A complete refrigeration system is provided to serve the ship's cooling system of approximately 9,000 cubic feet. 
two refrigeration units are provided, each capable of handling the normal sea load. The Savannah has some of the latest cargo handling gear available. In lieu of the normal king posts, a tabular rigid frame structure is used for the 10-ton booms. This is the lightest structure yet designed for Ebel rigged booms. I don't know what that means. If anybody wants to look it up and let me know, that would be amazing. Unless they're about to tell me. The Ebel, ring, uh, the Ebel rig is a modern method for fast cargo handling. The rig makes it possible for one or two deckhands to unstow and position all booms on the ship for cargo operations in less than an hour. And the shifting of booms from inshore to offshore operation during loading can be accomplished in one or two minutes by the winch operator without moving from his station. An inherent safety condition in this system makes the rig refuse to lift a load if tension in uh, if tension in the falls tends to exceed a safe limit. Reactor safety, hey, it's a nuclear powered ship. This might be important. Hi, Blue Rooster. Um, I, I saw your comment earlier and I forgot to say hi. Um, the Savannah's hull is built on a conventional transverse framing system, except for the inner bottom. All right, you've all seen the picture. Let's talk about this inner bottom. Since somebody said y'all like maps. Uh, I'm, I'm just gonna keep the whole thing here for now. This is uh, deck C and below as well as the inboard profile, but there is, so D deck is labeled as deep tank top, and then below that is, it's labeled as tank top. That's not a term I'm familiar with for ships. I had looked at this before and thought that it was, that the tank top was actually bottom up view, like from the keel, but I don't think it is. Is that just a term for like the lowest of the low part of the ship? Because it's not one I had seen before. Um, the Savannah's hull is built on a con conventional transverse framing system, except for the inner bottom. This inner bottom is egg crated below the reactor compartment with transverse floors running crosswise of the ship at every frame or rib of the vessel and with a deep vertical keel and many keelsons running in the fore and aft directions. What are keelsons? I'm not familiar with keelsons. I might have to look that one up. Um, the great strength thereby provided in the inner bottom assures very high resistance to damage to both ship and reactor in the unlikely event of grounding. I'm trying very, very hard. Because as we all know, on Twitch, we're all 13 on the internet. And some of the phrasing here, well, I think you know. <clears throat> the reactor compartment itself is located amidships uh, between two upright longitudinal collision bulkheads or partitions made of heavy steel. The bulkheads protect each side of the reactor between the bulkheads and the hull of the ship. Three decks of the vessel offer additional protection from collision. The flooring of each of the decks B, C, and D has special, heavier than normal steel plating welded to the deck beams for added strength. Inboard of the bulkheads are collision mats made up of alternate layers of inch thick steel and three inch redwood, redwood for a total mat thickness of 24 inches. Thus, in the event of a broadside collision opposite the reactor's space, the ramming ship would have to penetrate a total of 17 feet of stiffened ship structure, the heavy collision bulkheads and two feet of collision mat before reaching the heavy reactor containment shell or vessel. 
This steel containment shell rests in a cradle of steel where its bottom half is surrounded by a four foot thickness of reinforced concrete. The steel cradle, the concrete, and the containment shell itself would also have to be pierced before the actual reactor plant could be damaged. So unlike the USS Enterprise in Star Trek, they're not going to be ejecting their warp core. The um, reactor space that is so, so heavily protected, uh, you can see defined on the inboard um, profile view here, uh, this sort of circular region here, that is, that is where that reactor is protected. And Boy, howdy, is it protected. Um, <clears throat> uh, let's see. Protection of the containment complex from ship accidents was studied in detail in establishing the Savannah's design criteria. In particular, ship collisions were carefully reviewed and methods were developed to predict structural damage to vessels struck in collision. On the basis of these studies, the Savannah was designed and constructed to withstand, without damage to the nuclear reactor compartment, any collision with any of the ships making up 99% of the world's merchant fleet. In case of sinking, provision has been made to allow for automatic flooding of the containment shell of the reactor to prevent its collapse in deep waters. The flooding valves are designed to close upon pressure equalization so that containment integrity will be maintained even after sinking. Salvage connections have been installed to allow contain containment purging or filling with concrete in case of sinking in shallow water where recovery or mobilization of the reactor plant seems advisable. It does sound very important in a nuclear ship. And this was the first civilian nuclear ship um, launched in 1959. Paul Stryker, thank you for the follow. Um, Radiation protection, primary radiation shielding around the Savannah reactor, consists of a 17-foot high tank of high-strength carbon steel located within the containment shell and covered with a layer of lead to form two to four, uh, sorry, covered with a layer of lead from two to four inches thick. Um, I can actually show you. I realize I have pictures. Actually, I also have diagrams. Diagrams. This is a plan view of the Savannah's reactor system arrangement within the containment vessel. Sort of seemed like maybe I could show this because that's what we were talking about right now. Um, let's see, primary radiation shielding, uh, 17 foot high tank of high strength carbon steel located within the containment shell and covered with a layer of lead from two to four inches thick. The tank extends from a point well below the core of the reactor to a point well above it. The tank will permit a wall of water 33 inches thick to surround the reactor and when filled, constitutes the first line of resistance to radiation from within the reactor. In true Wednesday stream, stream tradition, you had customers come in and you're only able to sit back down now to the stream. Hey, I am very happy that the tradition is that you get customers um, whenever I go live because it makes me feel like I'm helping your business succeed. <laughs> um, surrounding this primary shielding is the heavy steel containment shell already mentioned. The top half of the shell is covered by a six inch layer of lead plus a six inch layer of polyethylene, each of which acts as additional radiation protection. The bottom half of the vessel, as indicated above, is surrounded by four feet of concrete shielding which protects against radiation as well as collision. The containment shell is designed to withstand the greatest possible pressure surge in the event of a maximum credible accident. That's in quotation marks. I don't know exactly what it means. Maximum credible accident. I'm guessing something to do with, like, 
the worst thing that they could think of that seemed feasible. Ah, they go on to define it. A hypothetical accident postulated in the study of reactor safety. In no credible reactor accident, can there be any hazardous release of radioactivity to the surroundings? Ah, Hannah, thank you for giving the shout out to 16-Bit Eric. Indeed, if anybody is here who does not already follow 16-Bit Eric, I highly recommend following 16-Bit Eric. Um, he is a joy to watch on stream. Uh, it is a very positive community, um, very focused on um, TTRPG uh, content, which if you watch any of the other programming on the BTUL Studios channel, um, then I presume that that is of interest to you. Uh, so yes, <clears throat> thank you for, for doing the shout out. I completely forgot that that was a thing. Uh, let's see. The container shell is designed, oh, I just read that. Power plant liquid and solid radioactive wastes are collected in tanks for disposal into a specially designed barge in port. The liquid waste collection tanks are equipped with monitoring devices. Gaseous wastes will normally be disposed of at sea through the radio mast, which contains two detectors for monitoring purposes. The detectors are an air... Ha. The detectors are an air particle monitor and a radio gas monitor. Both are designed to operate whenever gas is vented to the atmosphere. If radioactivity rises above specialized uh, above specified tolerance limits, the gas will be retained until it can be diluted and discharged below established tolerance limits. All monitors on the NS Savannah are intended to operate through a system of channels, with each channel covering a certain range of activity. All detectors are designed to relay their readings to the main control panel uh, in the control room where automatic recording and visual observation instruments are located. Portable monitoring equipment similar to conventional health physics survey equipment is provided for access survey and maintenance monitoring. Auxiliary power source. Uh, from the standpoint of, we're almost done with this document and then I'll show some, some photos quickly. Uh, from the standpoint of ship safety, assurance of sufficient power to maintain steerage and maneuverability is the principal requirement of the propulsion plant. To this end, duplication of machinery and power sources on the Savannah has been carried out to the fullest practicable degree. Two auxiliary 750 kilowatt diesel generator sets are on standby to provide the following. One, power to the main bus for operating those loads needed to supply cooling for decay, decay heat removal after an emergency reactor shutdown. Two, emergency take-home power designed to enable the ship to reach port should the nuclear power plant become inoperative. Three, power for reactor startup. And four, spare generating capacity for normal operation should a turbine generator become inoperative. In the event of a reactor shutdown, these generators will automatically start and synchronize on the main bus bar to supply and distribute power to the components used for reactor cooling. The 300 kilowatt emergency diesel generator is also available to supply power to the 450 volt emergency switchboard. This source will operate in case both the main turbine generators and auxiliary diesel generators do not. Loads connected to the emergency switchboard include lighting, low speed windings of the primary coolant pumps, and power for the emergency cooling system. A battery protected source will also provide power to those loads that require an especially dependable power source with no interruption due to loss or switching of auxiliary power. Oh, and it was dated April 9th, 1962. So it's a full detailed breakdown of, <clears throat> of basically like everything about this ship um, about two years after it first launched and about a year after it was fully, uh, fully constructed, which that was a neat document to look at. Um, uh, 
we have reached the official end time of the stream, but I do want to take a quick, quick look just a little bit further into the press kit because the press kit is neat. Um, there is so much more. There is so much more in this collection um, about Nuclear Ship Savannah. Um, of course, the press kit came in this lovely pouch. Um, and for those who weren't here at the beginning, the reason I have all this stuff is because um, Landis, whose papers these were, was the assistant manager for, um, what was the name of the company? Babcock and Wilcox, uh, the company that built the nuclear engine for the ship. He was the assistant manager of the atomic energy division for the company um, at the time the ship was being built. I feel like there's definitely at least one, maybe a couple episodes still in this collection. Oh yeah, and and I could probably do a second episode on the Savannah. Um, Cause there's more here. And then there's other stuff like, but there's other nuclear ship related stuff and then just other nuclear related stuff. So, yeah, we'll definitely be revisiting the Landis papers in future episodes. Um, but some quick photos here, because they are also pretty fun. This is stuff from the press kit. Um, <clears throat> from Lucan's Steel Company, Coatesville, Pennsylvania. Uh, Coatesville, Pennsylvania. For immediate release, Coatesville, Pennsylvania. Oh, to be a secretary at Lucan's Steel Company. Um, can we dr just drop the historical terms? Uh, comment in chat on both channels, please. Um, there's definitely going to be some um, sexism in this advertising copy. Uh, <laughs> Oh, to be a secretary at Lucan's Steel Company. Part of the job is testing the world's first atomic swimming pool made of Lucan's Monel clad steel. This nuclear version <coughs> of the old swimming hole was designed for the first atomic powered merchant ship, the Savannah, which will be launched July 21st at the New York Shipbuilding Corporation, Camden, New Jersey. This new type of shipboard swimming pool is easy to clean, easy to keep clean. It eliminates the usual expensive repair problems of old-fashioned tile pools. Lucan's Steel Company also furnished hull plate for the Savannah and supplied the alloy steel plates from which the nuclear reactor which powers the ship was fabricated, fabricated by Babcock and Wilcox Company, New York, prime contractors for the ship's propulsion system. <clears throat> I mean, I, I think they're just describing it as a nuclear pool. I believe it is just a steel swimming pool. This swimming pool would be the one that, according to the diagrams, was up on a deck. So this is like, um, this is the equivalent of the on deck swimming pool on a cruise ship today. And they've just finished making it. And so the secretaries apparently at like, they had their employees testing the pool um, before it would then be shipped to be installed in the ship. Yeah. It is not, they're not, um, they're not swimming in uh, the water that would be used to cool the nuclear reactor. Yeah, 1959, they're not quite that inexperienced with um, atomic energy. <laughs> uh, 
Um, let's see. We've got a diagram here. I don't have, let me see if I've got a caption for it. You can see the, sh the, the ship down at the bottom, but I'm not sure what this part is. <laughs> Um, yeah, wow, this is like, this is the technical press information for the Savannah, and like, I could do an entire episode just on this, because it's really cool. I'm not certain exactly which piece is being shown there. But we have the interior view of the Savannah's pressurized water reactor, um, designed and built by the Babcock and Wilcox Company. The atomic fuel is housed in the square-shaped fuel elements shown in the central region of the reactor vessel. I'm assuming here. It's the only square I see. The rods that extend up through the vessel head control or through the vessel head, control the fission process, the chain reaction. This will be one of the most advanced, yet conservatively designed, pressurized water reactors in existence. Built by the New York Shipbuilding Corporation, the Savannah is a joint Atomic Energy Commission Maritime Administration project. <coughs> um, and then we get this, I love this advertising illustration where Here's the ship. And it's it's like the like 1940s, 1950s uh, instructional videos or instructional images where it's like, here's where baby sits in mommy's belly. Um, but in this case, it's here's where the nuclear reactor sits within the ship. And, but it's exactly that same style of like, we're just gonna like show you the thing and then we're just gonna cut out and show you what, what's inside here, um, which is kind of neat looking. Um, do you wanna see what one of the staterooms for the passengers looked like? Do that quick. I, I can't run over too far. Uh, but I've got a couple more minutes. I can I could go a maximum of like 15 minutes over because then I have to pack up uh, and and I have to pack all this stuff up, take it back down to my office before I can go home and um, have stuff I have to get done before like a thing that starts. So um, yeah, don't go to sleep, computer. So uh, here we have an NS Savannah sample stateroom. <coughs> Decorative partition with its glass and honeycomb uh, grill divide, uh, grill divides room into sitting and sleeping areas, giving the effect of a suite. Stateroom has two beds and sofa berth at rear to accommodate a third person. Private bathroom adjoins room. Sample stateroom designed by Jack Keeney and Associates to obtain the most practical arrangement and pleasing appearance possible. The Savannah, uh, and it goes on to the same. <clears throat> uh, here's the steam turbine. Um, so that's, the steam turbine is what actually generates the power after the nuclear reactor heats up the water to create steam to run the turbine. Yeah, 50s furniture, it, it, it has a very particular style that reads as very classic and in some ways just feels timeless because of it. I'm not certain why. I think it's partly the, the clean lines uh, and stuff like that. But yeah, it is, I, I like it as well. Ah, 
How about this? Mock-up of nuclear power plants. <clears throat> the mock-up is a full-scale model of the Savannah's nuclear power plant constructed at the New York Shipbuilding Corporation Camden, New Jersey shipyard. The arrangement of components and piping is exactly the same as on the Savannah itself, down to the smallest detail. The overall mock-up is approximately 70 feet long and 55 feet high. The containment vessel is outlined in skeleton form to permit a clear view of the internals. The Savannah, uh, same tag as all of the others. <clears throat> and then this is the containment vessel. 35 feet in diameter, 50.5 feet long, located in the reactor space. It houses the entire reactor plant and primary cooling system. Designed to contain all the water and steam released in the event of a mechanical failure of the pressurized water loops. And to support the lead and polyethylene shielding, about 500 tons, covering the upper half of the containment vessel. And then this is, this is that, they took this picture and that picture of the ship that they did the cutout, this is the picture that was inside the cutout. Which just sort of looks like a, it reminds me honestly of a sonogram. bunch of rods. Those would be fuel rods, as referred to when talking about nuclear reactors. Each fuel element assembly contains four bundles of 41 fuel rods. The fuel is uranium oxide enriched to 4.2 and 4.6 percent U-235. Uh, the active fuel is contained in the central 60 inches of the 72 inch bundle length the fuel is received in the form of powder and compressed into pellets. There are approximately 650,000 such pellets in the 5,248 fuel rods that make up the reactor core. That is a lot. Um, wow. Ooh. Um, <clears throat> there's the schematic section of the reactor, which is cool, and I think we'll spend more time on it because I'm definitely going to have to do another episode on this. Don't know when, uh, probably not until sometime next year at the earliest, um, but we'll see. I don't know. If people are screaming for it, I can always do it sooner. Um, this one caught my eye because I like this illustration. I mean, I loved the diagrams that we went through before, but I like this. The world's first nuclear-powered passenger cargo ship, the NS Savannah, is subdivided as shown. The passenger area accommodates 60 passengers and the cargo capacity is 10,000 tons. A gallery allows passengers an unrestricted view of the machinery compartment as well as the glass-enclosed main control room. The ship, designed by George Sharp Incorporated, Naval Architects, is 595.5 feet long, 78 feet beam, draws 29 and a half feet, and displaces 21,840 tons. It was built by the New York Shipbuilding Corporation. Prime contractor for the nuclear propulsion uh, was the Babcock Wilcox Company, the one that the person that Landis, whose papers these are, uh, worked for. Uh, the Savannah is a joint project of the Atomic Energy Commission and the Maritime Administration. And, and yeah, um, <clears throat> so sadly, I don't have more time. I, 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 I have to end stream, but yes, they have passengers. So <clears throat> they have food storage right next to it. Um, they have, the hospital is right next to it. Uh, like depending on which deck you're on. I think there's like a hallway between the staterooms and where the reactor is. But yeah, like the space for the reactor runs the entire height of the ship. And 
the central area under this part that sticks up is the area that includes recreational areas, um, state rooms, food storage, uh, sick bay, things like that. Uh, these four sections, these four forward sections are cargo and these uh, items marked hold five, six, and seven are also cargo. So yeah, all the passenger stuff is from uh, the promenade deck down to C deck. So we've got, or down to B deck. So promenade, which is this, the deck that's labeled passenger area. And then A deck is below that and B deck is below that. And just sort of this area here, that's the area that passengers were allowed. Uh, except that on A deck, there's also like on top of the deck area, like an outdoor area where um, like the, the swimming pool is back here somewhere. <clears throat> yeah, seems weird to me too. I'm not sure I'd be comfortable with it. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> yeah, I do need to, I do need to wind down the stream um, because I have to pack all this up, take it back to my office, and then it's time for me to head home uh, so that I can um, get to the next thing that's on my schedule in a little bit of time. So let me see where we're going to raid. Um, <clears throat> I, I have some idea, because it's been a month. But um, come on, brain. Um, I'm trying to think what next week is. Next week, I'm doing uh, materials about World War II on the home front. Hang on. Didn't catch the, I, did, I didn't manage to mute that tab soon enough. Um, so I've got things, uh, collections that include things like um, ration stamps, uh, scrap collection campaigns, um, some materials about uh, the draft here in the U.S. Um, so uh, various collections about World War II on the home front um, <clears throat> are, is what we're going to look at next Wednesday. Um, and yeah, it's been a month. So I am going to be raiding Stephen Joyce. Um, who we raid fairly regularly uh, from this sh show. Also, uh, coming up in two weeks, we will have um, Archivist Kira joining, and we will be talking about frosted sandwiches. Uh, so, <laughs> um, but if you would join me for a raid of Stephen Joyce, um, Stephen is a wonderful, lovely, in, uh, very welcoming streamer wears tiny hats, um, does video games, uh, sometimes will go off on um, just random, uh, random uh, rants about uh, the state of the world. Oh, very relatable. Um, and it's just, just a joyful, joyful person currently playing Power Wash Simulator. So we are going to pop on over there. Um, setting up to, to raid from both channels. But uh, yeah, thank you all so much for joining me. I hope that I will be seeing you again soon uh, for another upcoming Archival Adventures episode. Um, and yeah, until I do see you again, uh, please, please keep exploring history. Um, and yeah. Until later.